tonight we are talking about the versatility of drones, and that is also something that a lot of people are, um, have various, various ideas about, and so they are here to straighten that out for you. This is gonna be some great information tonight, and you have on the back of your, on the back of your, what we call a program, is the information about the speakers. Apologize for small print, but, you know, that, they have a, we have a lot to say about them. They're really well-educated and very, very broad-based people. So, uh, rather than rereading that to you, I'm just going to give you their title and who is who up here, so you can relate it back to your program. So, we have Lori Carpenter, guess which one she is? <laughs> and Lori is a hydrologist and a hydrogeologist, and she's also a PWS. What is that? Professional wetland scientist. Professional wetland scientist. Okay. Boy, did I use you when I was supposed to take my two year old. Okay. Uh, C P E S C. What is that? Oh, a certified professional growth and zone control. Oh, I can use you too for that. All right. Um, I have a certification for everything. <laughs> Then we have Eric Severitz, who's here um, closest to me, he's a brave man, um, and he is the CEO of Above Geo. And the reason we asked him was at the governor's business conference in, in 2017, that a bunch of businesses get up, 10 of you I think, and you each had to try and sell your program to the audience in five minutes as to why you should get special funding. And when I was watching that, his popped out, his was amazing. And so he got my, my public vote along with the 10 people I was with. We all like yours best. So, that was great. Then we have retired Lieutenant Colonel Warren Rapp, and he is the business director for the University of Nevada, Reno Advanced Autonomous Systems Innovation Center. And I'm sure that's all put together to mean something, but I'm not really sure exactly what, but it was <coughs> really great. These guys are amazing. Then we have uh, Rod Rummel, a local boy, Carson City Fire Department, and he's, oh, you're the only Remote pilot in command. Oh boy. Man, you are rocking with power. You are the guy. So that's fantastic. And you have a BA degree in forest management, too. So we're probably going to be hearing a little bit from him tonight about how those, how those two play together. Can I say something? In case of an emergency tonight, emergency exits are up on the second floor and this door right here. You know, now you have all the fun out and scrambling around looking for an exit. <laughs> It's a fireman in me. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to have to add it to my repertoire of things that I tell people about things. One more thing. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Lori for just a second because what Lori will do is kind of give you an overview of what each of the, the four of them are going to be talking about tonight. We each have about 15, 20 minutes. And so you'll see kind of how this thing is going to flow tonight. All right? So thank you for your kind attention and thank you for being here tonight. Okay, the way that we've organized this, because we all overlap, is that Warren's going to start because Warren actually, does it work? Okay, so Warren's going to start because Warren's talking about the eight airspace, so he's going to be flying things at above 15,000 feet, and then Eric's going to go next because he's going to talk about um, the range of um, all aerial, aerial solutions, and then we're going to come into the forestry and the public end, and then I'm going to follow up and end with citizen scientists and use of drones by small um, other scientists. Um, I would like to start by saying I am uh, Warren Rapp, a retired lieutenant colonel from the Air Force. I did 10 years in the Marines and then 17 years in the Air Force. I decided to grow my hair and get a grow my hair and get a personality and join the Air Force after 10 years in the Marines. <laughs> Everybody but Marines laugh at that. And they get mad. <laughs> so. Um, I love being in Carson City, kind of a long story, my, my family is uh, basically native Nevadans. My uh, parents were married in Hawthorne in 1956, and uh, then my grandparents, because they were living there, which is when my parents got married there, decided to move to the metropolis of Mason, Nevada, and I spent a lot of summers out there. And then my dad uh, served in the military as well for 20 years, and when he retired, he came back first to Carson City, and uh, we lived in Carson back in 1977, and I lived for a summer in Campintown, if you know that on the uh, north end. I had a place right across from McDonald's there, and that's where I spent my whole summer. So I never forget that place. Every time I drive into Carson, it's like I, at the McDonald's is still there, and I, you know, I have my cholesterol way up after one summer because that's where I ate every morning. Um, and then uh, my dad, and I don't know how many of you are native Carson City people, but uh, Dwight Millard, 
who's here is my uh, uncle. So, uh, and if he built your house and you hate it, don't throw stuff at me. Um, so tonight, I'm, you know, whether I'm first or last, I came with Lori, who wanted to be here very early. And uh, we got here early, we literally the first three here, and so I got nominated to be the first. And so uh, whether mine fits in appropriately or not, but I'm gonna actually talk about something above what I would call kind of the, the ground level drones that you can find on Amazon or, or you know, slightly larger than that. And, and go what they call the Group 3 uh, LA or UAS vehicles, which are the ones that are anywhere over 55 pounds all the way up to 1,300 pounds. Um, I retired from the Air Force in 2014, and the job I did, I was one of the commanders at Creech Air Force Base. That were, it's in southern Nevada, and we were exploiting the, uh, the MQ-1s, MQ-9s, the very large-scale uh, UAVs in, in the Middle East and other places. So from there, I came and ran the States program, um, opening up with the FAA, most of you should probably know that we were selected as one of the six test sites to actually do testings of these uh, vehicles. And one of the reasons why is because what Nevada isn't. There's still a lot of open space in the state where you can go out, crash them, do whatever, and nobody cares. Uh, from there, I did work at the university. I am not currently the director anymore. I actually started my own corporation uh, last fall. And that's, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that as I start tonight. We are a new company in Nevada and uh, kind of tell you just less than three minutes who we are, what we're about, and, and kind of go from there. That picture you see on there, uh, I've already heard a couple people talking, thinking that's a drone that's like this big. That drone's actually as big as a Cessna, and it's being created in Dubai as a taxi, an aerial autonomous taxi cab for people. Um, and they are not alone with that. Uber, has everyone heard of Uber? <laughs> They're doing the same thing. China is doing the same thing. And it is one of the next phases of where this will eventually go, and that is, just like Tesla cars, you're going to have an autonomous taxi cab show up that will aerially transport you to wherever you want to go. And, and I say that with full belief. It's, it's not right around the corner because of FAA deconfliction issues and others, but I think within the next 10 years, you will see robust markets in certain areas that will be utilizing that type of technology. Got to remember to point that way and don't look behind me. So quickly uh, about what our company does. Uh, one thing I realized when I was running the, the state program and then I've been uh, setting up a lot of the testing these last year I did with NASA here in Nevada is the small drones are a great way to innovate and, to, and get research done on a small level. But when it comes to larger areas like mapping out the Sierras or carrying heavy equipment or, or not, um, or trying to do beyond line of sight flying, which is what we were attempting to do with NASA, the small drones just simply weren't cutting it. And, uh, you know, coming from a background, we flew Predators and Reapers that were as big as A-10s that could stay airborne for 24 hours. Uh, it was quite the switch for me to grasp on to flying that and then flying a, you know, relative Amazon toy, trying to get things done. So uh, our company has decided to kind of pick the middle of the road, not as big as the Predators, but we're looking at the uh, Middle-sized drones, like I said, somewhere around 500 to 800 pounds, and their engine horsepower is anywhere from 60 to maybe 90 horsepower. And then we're also doing other types of technologies that are associated with it. We don't develop them. What we, we generally try to do, because we're a startup, is we look at existing technologies and with our expertise and the things that we decide we can make them better through companies here in Nevada or outside of Nevada. We grab those very few companies and, uh, and exploit that technology through a business model. Um, our objectives are basically to um, collab collaborate with research and development institutions, um, look at industry, look at, uh, we have private investors that are part of our company, and that's basically how we, we kind of set up. The one thing that we are trying to do, and I'm going to explain this in a, in a minute, uh, the drone engine technology for the DOD and the Department of Energy and others, those engines that are made right now, uh, are really in kind of a pickle as far as trying to get new parts and get those made. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. Maybe I won't tell you why in a minute. There we go. So quickly, uh, I am on the left in the middle is Ben Segal. He is our uh, kind of corporate investor slash co-founder of the company. He manages a $3 billion hedge fund in New York. And then to his right is Heidi Dose. Interesting story, I met her throughout uh, some different business dealings. 
She works as an executive at Google. I talked her into moving to Reno, so she now has a house out in Spanish Springs, her and her husband. She's part of our company, and she's what's helping us on the international front. And her goal, like mine and others, is to develop this company so she never has to go back to Google, which is where she still works weekly in Silicon Valley. So why focus on fuel-driven engines versus drones? Uh, that's what I'm going to talk a lot about tonight. It's not saying one's better than the other, but the applications as such uh, broaden up and or more restricted depending on what you're trying to research and how you're trying to use that particular drone. This is one thing that is true, though, that, that I like to uh, state. This is my frustration with NASA. And basically it states, you can't read that, drones are used for various applications such as aero picturing, disaster recovery and delivery. Despite the attraction, uh, attracting attention as a new growth area, the biggest problem of drones is small battery capacity and limited flight time. On average, those small drones you see are less than 20 minutes. Uh, and if you put any kind of payload, even the people that claim they can get an hour out of them, and these are primarily the helicopters. Now we talk fixed wing, and Lori's gonna talk about that, that adds a new element, because it actually takes advantage of lift and like an airplane is supposed to do, but being a former, Helicopter pilot in the Marines, I understood, uh, you know, then that helicopters are not aerodynamic. They do beat the air into submission and they're not, you know, fuel efficient in a lot of ways. So why drone engines? Anything. I swear. So why focus on drone engines? Uh, I mentioned to you there's an issue. And now in the middle-sized drones right now, two years ago, Lycoming, who was one of the last U.S. manufacturers, sold out to China. And so when you talk to a lot of the DOD agencies that are using certain aircraft that are called the Viking, the um, Sierra aircraft, the Ravens, and others you've probably heard if you read Air Force Times and others, um, type of DOD publications, there is... Um, a market problem right now because they can't get replacement parts to get replacement engines is actually costing quite a bit of time. And when you look at the things that are happening with China right now and some of the tariffs and also what they call ITAR restrictions, you're not even able to buy some of these engines that China bought out uh, from US entities. So most of the engine manufacturings or the parts come from either Europe or China now. And this is for DOD aircraft, and uh, which is a scenario you never want to be in when you talk about defense. Okay, you can hear about this a lot, so I'm not going to go over too much other than the fact that the, the different areas that you're looking at for the uh, exploitation you've heard over and over with drones, on the larger scale, if you can see that, the ones that we primarily focus on, when you look at transportation, agriculture, those are the ones when you start getting into bigger sized drones for different reasons. If you're going to spray crops and do other things, you have to have a larger platform to do that. The small ones simply won't do it. If you're talking about photography and mapping and things like that, then that the smaller drones, be it the fixed wing and or the helicopters, can certainly do that and do it very well. Telecommunications, I'm gonna tell you an interesting story here in a minute about uh, one of the platforms I have. Um, and then the entertainment and media, almost every movie you see now that's got aerial scenes is using drones. It's just cheaper, you can get better photography, and, and it's a lot more flexible to, to shoot a scene over and over again if you don't get the picture that you want than trying to get a manned aircraft to do it. Yes, I was a pilot, I swear. <laughs> Run the remote tonight. Can you? Are you just telling me? He told us to go all Well, that's the slide I want to be on. So, um, this is just to give you some numbers about, you know, because they're still doubting Thomas is thinking, well, this thing is just a fad, it's going to come and go. I can tell you it's not. Uh, expected to reach 22.15 billion by 2022. Most people, that if you're into aviation, you realize every airliner that comes off the assembly line today is fully autonomous, meaning it doesn't need a pilot. UPS, FedEx, United States mail carriers all have unmanned divisions right now that are researching cheaper, better ways to, to deliver mail 
by drones. Not so much in very populated areas, but when you look in Kansas and some of these other places, if you've ever seen those movies where a UPS truck does this amazing maze, gets to one house, drops a package off, can see the next house that's maybe five acres over, but has to drive 30 acres around in order to get back to that house. So you can imagine a car that shows up or a truck, it's got 30 drones already pre-programmed with the packages numbered, they get in there and they start launching them and these things from one truck just start delivering and coming back. They get low on batteries, they pop another one on there and it goes to the next house. All the farmers have already signed up on designated places, they want their packages delivered. Much more efficient than trying to do the one-man UPS truck all over the, the state of Kansas. Just an example. I put this in here, I'm not going to go through, but this is just in the last couple years, all of the different DOD agencies that are asking for new middle-sized engine manufacturers. They are asking anybody and everybody to develop an engine that lasts longer and that can go farther. The, the Viking aircraft, which is the one that we are working with NASA right now, has a Zanzatera engine that after every 35 hours of whopping flight, they have to do an overhaul on it because it's basically running and topping because it's not really powerful enough to be in the plane with what they've added onto it. Here are some of the uh, small scale versus large scale comparisons. It's kind of a busy slide, but the thing that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the endurance is probably one of the biggest issues you have with small drones because they're powered by batteries. Um, average, you know, 15 to 45 minutes. If you get the fixed wings, you can maybe go up to two hours. Those are primarily made out of very lightweight materials, even styrofoam, and their payload capability is actually pretty limited. They can take small cameras, but if you want them to be the workhorse, you're really not going to get that. There's the payloads, minimum half pounds, some of them up to maybe 10 or 12 pounds, and that's it. When you look at the group three, which we're focusing on, they can do 100 pounds or more. The beautiful thing about a larger aircraft when you get into that kind of a element is that the smaller ones, it's not that they can't do multiple or different types of tasks, they just have to do a separate flight for each. Just like the military aircraft, the larger ones, you can actually put a multi, multi or hypo spectral camera on there. You can put sensing devices, you can do you know, lots of different things you can put on that uh, and, and fly in one flight and get three sets of data coming back because you can carry that by having to do one flight for each. So that is one of the benefits. And then weather, of course, believe it or not, even the stuff that we were flying overseas uh, from Creek Air Force Base in Southern Nevada are very, uh, not, I would say, not very weather tolerant. Not just because of the icing, which was normally our biggest issue, that we were up at you know, anywhere from 19 to 23,000 feet. But the other problem would be, and I don't know if you're familiar with how we control those drones, um, but we started Creech Air Force Base, there are high-speed data lines that go underneath the United States, underneath the Atlantic Ocean, back up into Europe, to Germany, from there, and those are basically traveling in fiber optics, so one third of the speed of light, from Germany up to satellites and then distributed out to the different platforms that are in the air. So when I would move the joystick on these particular platforms, can anyone guess what the, uh, the delay was from when I said I want to turn left? Three seconds. Okay, three seconds. Anybody else? half to three quarters of a second. That's how fast it was. Pretty amazing stuff. Now, what did us in? Weather. So that signal that went from the antenna farm up to the satellites, if Ramstein had a big thunderstorm going on, which happened my second flight after I was signed off as a mission commander, uh, it can actually block your signal. And the same thing can happen in severe weather with you know, any type of drone. If you have a control mechanism that's line of sight, uh, that's one of the things you need to be, to be careful with, obviously. So not what I wanted to happen on my second mission flying those things. $12 million aircraft, basically what they call Lost Link flying itself because I programmed that mission into it back to my base, but no way of me really verifying that it was doing what I thought it was going to do. So any former military pilots in here at all? None? Okay. Even if you crash these in the military, they're a drone, they think they don't care at all. They care every bit as much as you were in that plane flying. So we would start drinking water because they were doing urinalysis on us within like, you know, half an hour of our plane actually impacting the ground. So all these young lieutenants would always look at me like, sir, why are you drinking so much water? And I was like, because I know what's going to happen here in about 20 minutes if things don't get better. And so they just were always raise an eyebrow, that weird guy, as soon as things get bad, he starts drinking water like he's really nervous. He's like, no, we're going to be sitting in front of a flight surgeon. 
shortly, and it's not going to be fun. Okay, so cost. Your blade of doubt was what I would call it uh, UAV on the civilian side. It can start at about 10,000. It can go all the way up to maybe 30, 40, 50,000. Um, on the Group 3 side, like the Viking 400, we're working with NASA, starts at a half a million dollars. And then the systems you put on it will probably get it close to about 700 plus thousand. So not cheap. Uh, what's easy about the, if you look in the categories, easy to use for the, the smaller drones, uh, hand or single point launch. The, the Viking aircraft need about 1,600 feet of runway to land in normal conditions. They do have some different types of catapult or coils that they can put across the runway to stop you much quicker, almost like an aircraft carrier. And then, as I said, they can carry up a lot uh, more payload. All right, we're almost done here. I know I'm probably close to the end of my, my time here. So I've got several different, uh, I'm gonna try to turn here and talk at the same time. If you look at the one in the far upper left, that's very much similar to the one that you saw in the very beginning, that, that personnel care that's being developed. The one problem they're having with that, guess what, is endurance because of the lithium ion batteries. Right now, most scientists will tell you the lithium ion battery is as packed with energy as it's gonna get. And Tesla has found that out as well, which is why they're looking at alternatives like lithium sulfur batteries and other things because, and even hybrid cars, which they don't want to go into, but uh, the current formats and the, just the science behind lithium ion batteries are not going to get any better anytime soon. So that's one thing. Most people are okay with getting into a Tesla car that's battery powered because if the battery runs out, you coast to a stop and you get out. If you're airborne, that's a whole different realm, right? <laughs> That thing runs out of batteries and it's a Hail Mary, you tell my family I love them and you're done. So, not a good thing. If you look uh, below that, the solar powered, NASA and some other folks and even Google came up with very large solar powered aircraft that would go up to like 40, 50,000 feet. They were almost um, perpetual in how long they could stay airborne. But the problem they had is they were not very wind tolerant because one of these actually kind of disintegrated in flight, might even been this one and then not very good on the weather side of it either, just because of the nature of trying to make a huge glider with solar panels on it. Now, if you go in the middle, on the very top, this is a very interesting one. This is a hydrogen-powered UAV developed by Boeing. It's called a Phantom Eye. Okay, it can go up to, a, and it's typical Boeing, 60,000 feet or plus. It's designed to actually provide intermediate networks. Let's say the satellites go down, and they say it's for civilian use or hurricanes, there's also military application, obviously. If the, the war starts in space, we don't have communications. This thing might go up there and actually provide that. It's unmanned, it's powered by hydrogen. Can anyone take a guess how long it can stay airborne for? 24 hours? 30? 10 days on one tank of hydrogen. So um, you can imagine that. It can literally cover, one of these can cover almost the whole western seaboard with, with cell coverage or whatever you're trying to utilize it for as a relay. And then below that is the gas power, the, the RMAX. This was uh, developed in Japan back in the early 90s, believe it or not. It's used for agriculture. They have almost 1,000 today. They're completely autonomous, and they actually spray and service the crops every morning. They go out there, they fill them up. They have a program already done, one person for every two to three planes and they have this huge farm and they just go out there and start flying on their own. They come back, they refuel them, reload the pesticide, fertilizer, whatever they're putting into them, and out they go again. And then the last, I'm not gonna cover another electrical power, but on the far right on the bottom is the, uh, the Reaper, which I actually uh, flew at Creech Air Force Base. And again, we had an endurance of, we were you know, 21, 22 hours plus, and it was actually gas powered. Hopefully this video works. Uh, I want to show you a video that talks about just summary some of the things you can do with a very larger size drone. This is actually battery powered, but it kind of gives you some examples of things that are typically done. You can imagine when it talks about the wind farm and de-icing big wind farm blades, what can be done with a drone and doing the same thing. So let me see if this works. There's no talking, it's just me with the drone. Can you all see it? Can you turn off the lights up here? This one? No? It's actually 
de-icing this wave, which are about 300 feet above the ground. Some of them are up to 800 feet. Normally, a person has to go up there and actually climb down a bungee type thing and reach out there and de-ice them and take that stuff out. Water rescue and firefighting. <coughs> Let me get the lights back up. I wanted to show you that video because those are some of the things people don't normally think about. And one of the examples that's online with that firefighting video is that. Um, it has a power cord kind of attached to it that's really long. It shows up to a 27-story building. This is all an emotional scenario. And normally what it takes, and Rod would probably know, is to get a fire truck in there and hoist it up and then trying to spray water, which still doesn't reach the upper floors. Now you can take a drone, go up to the 26th floor, and have the water pumped directly from the car and just flow it right into wherever the issue might be. Two of you doing rescues as well. You saw that one drone that's probably from me to the, the fire chief there, uh, that can carry 400 pounds. So you can imagine sitting something up there with a, a tote line below it, having somebody hang on to it and taking them out of a place. This just gives you a little bit of a, a different perspective on kind of the introductory drones and then what's coming down to kind of the commercial sector. And we focused on the gas engines, engine side of it because we realized that one, even in the personnel carriers, they're trying to develop that the, the lithium ion batteries are not hacking it. And they're gonna go to the engines, which all of the DOD mid-size drones that they utilize as kind of workforces are all engine powered. Um, we are located at STED. I have some cards if you have interest in coming up and uh, seeing us. We're still kind of getting set up on some things. But I'm excited to be in Nevada, taking this to uh, Nevada. And I'm really excited to hear some of the things we're going to hear after me because these folks, uh, I've heard a couple of them speak before, very interesting stuff. So thank you very much. And I'll answer questions, I guess, when we're, we're done. Thank you. OK. Um, I'm Eric Severance. I'm the CEO of Bub Geo. We believe there are better, faster, and safer ways to help people meet their land management needs. And we're providing those today from the air. But don't we all wish we had a crystal ball or magic wand? Well, we have some of those. Let me give you some examples. For one of our agricultural customers, this is Winnemucca Farms, we can see heat stress and crop health in their potato crops three weeks before the human eye can, giving them time to react. We help ski resorts know how much snow is underneath their snow cats while they're grooming in the middle of the night. And help them determine how much more snow to make. The BLM has thousands of square miles to manage, including projects for wildlife habitat, fire ecology, and invasive species. We're dramatically improving field measurement techniques for them, which significantly cut costs and improve survey quality. For the military, we're flying over remote sites to find unexploded bombs. And 
we do sophisticated mapping for mining customers and help them solve problems like volume calculations of their huge tailing piles efficiently and safely, which currently requires surveyors to climb the piles, which can lead to injuries, delays. We do it from the air in minutes. So landowners and managers need to know what exists and what's happening on their land now. For example, asset management, productivity, operations, security, and for future needs like planning, development, etc. We provide the services to assist with achieving these goals from the air and then turn that collected data into information-rich output such as 2D and 3D and topo maps with great detail. The drone industry is a disruptive technology that is changing the way many businesses do uh, their business. Above Geo is a leader in this space and is currently focused on and delivering on what drone services can do now. We provide UAV services and analysis to various industries and agencies at a fraction of the cost compared to current collect data collection methods. So there's a plethora of plethora of information that's part of the real world. So think of the layers or slices that are out there that are used for a variety of purposes and needs. This data and information it contains need to be acquired and analyzed, and then the findings delivered to customers to be able to act on. So what's the problem that we're addressing and solving? Current data collection requires either ground crews, manned aircraft, or satellites. The problem often is that these can be inaccurate, extensive, and inefficient. So let's explore this a little further. The top row there, satellites, provide broad data that are expensive to operate, and most customers can't alter a satellite's mission. The bigger problem is they're not often accurate enough limited resolution. Manned aircraft, such as helicopters and small planes, are expensive to operate and equip. Ground crews are useful, but their range is limited. They're also often for, for, forced to extrapolate the results from a limited data sample or a survey area, resulting in inaccuracies. So there's a gap here, and there's a great need for a better approach. Above Geo fills this gap. Above Geo uses fixed wing, multi-rotor, unmanned aircraft with multiple high-tech sensors to go beyond the capabilities of many current technologies. A slow fixed wing, low-flying drone can adequately cover large areas and still provide great detail. A multi-rotor drone can fly even slower and can provide high, even higher quality imaging data that can be used for such things as 3D modeling and uh, topos, etc. We can provide our services for a fraction of the cost of the other methods. So we help, can help solve the price problem, the efficiency problem, and the accuracy problem. Above Geo can also provide a number of advanced outputs, such as 3D maps and virtual environments. We use high-tech sensors such as near-infrared, hyperspectral, and LIDAR to provide detailed statistical analysis in such areas as volumetrics. That's the picture on the left illustrates showing how much, how much material is in a tailings pile for a mining customer. Or, as the picture on the right illustrates, vegetative analysis showing fire fuel levels in sensitive range habitats. Let's talk about precision agriculture for a minute and crop health. Large farms like our customer Winnemucca Farms spend millions to prepare the land for high yield healthy crops. But they don't have a way to know as the growing season progresses detailed crop health data, especially in small zones within their larger fields. We fly these fields on a periodic basis throughout the growing season 
using near infrared sensors and produce images such as these showing infrared crop health based on chlorophyll levels. This information gives them actionable information weeks before humans can tell so they can make changes as the growing season progresses, greatly improving yields and quality. This can also be applied to orchards and trees. We can also provide complex modeling and simulations. Another one of our customers, Q&D Construction, and their customer, Wild West Motorsports <coughs> Racetrack, needed a way to understand how to conduct and maintain consistent grading throughout the race season of their dirt tracks. We flew the property with a variety of imaging sensors and created rich 3D visual and video models, including first-person views, to show how the track could look and could be graded and maintained per their specs, helping you the construction and their customer meet their needs. We do analysis in on the data we collect and provide the customer with actionable information, which improves their business. We also do photography and videography. such as this promotion marketing piece done for a local ski resort, Diamond Peak. And inspections, such as this uh, radio tower. So land managers and companies have a great need for capabilities that we offer in a wide variety of business sectors and with an array of different specific needs, like you see on the list here. Better maps, big data, and tools for evaluating assets allows them to better understand the properties that they manage. Right here in the Western states, there are huge environmental issues that we help government agencies with. For instance, the sage grouse issue that the BLM and Forest Service are currently dealing with. Above Geo provides end-to-end -end solutions specific to the customer's needs, from flight planning to final reports. But note, drones are not the product here. The data collection, analysis, and reports turned into actionable information is the product. We're basically drone or aircraft agnostic. Uh, it can be Electrically powered small aircraft, it can be large gas powered, it can be manned aircraft. It's, it's about what the customer needs. Our aircraft are many and each is designed to satisfy specific mission requirements. We have a variety of post-processing capabilities that focus our efforts on the end result for the customer. Our product is the result, not the tools or the process. This is a partial list of some of the customers we have in various vertical markets and industries. And these are both in the private sector and in the public sector. And here's some recent projects and accomplishments. We've also been honored to receive some uh, uh, awards uh, in our wonderful state. We're very proud of it. So with the ever-expanding desire to improve productivity, efficiency, and profitability, efficiently collecting data and turning it into actionable information is more and more in demand. The expertise to acquire and analyze this data is rare and is what Above Geo offers. We'd love to tell you more about Above Geo. Thank you. We got all this fancy technology that, that we use, maybe not on a daily basis. I know I don't use it on a daily basis, but they might.
but it all comes down to this little clicker that we cannot figure out. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Rod Rummel. I am the Wildland Fuels Management Officer for uh, your local fire department, Carson City Fire Department. Um, I'm not quite sure how I fit into the, the, the rest of the speakers here because I am by no means an expert. Uh, I kind of fell into this drone industry uh, kind of by luck, I guess, because they're a whole lot of fun to fly and we get some great information out of them, but I'm a forester. I, I deal with trees and I deal with vegetation on a daily basis. Um, I got into the drone business uh, or kind of industry just by our fire chief coming and saying, we need to get into this. C can we use this as a tool? Um, and so I told them, heck yeah, we can use it as a tool. Um, so we purchased one and we still haven't been able to use it to its capacity. So let's see if I can get low. Oh, see, no, going too fast. So, Carson City Fire Department, we have a DJI Phantom 4, which by now is very old technology. We've had it for almost two years now. Um, it's a small quadcopter that fits in a small box that I could put in the truck and, and, and I take it wherever I need to within the city. Um, we can launch it relatively quickly um, in emergency situations, get it up in the air so we can get eyes, a different perspective on whatever emergency or whatever mission we're trying to accomplish with it at that time. Here's some specs of the DJI for according to DJI, the company that makes it. Uh, it says it has a max speed of 45 miles an hour, which it does not. <laughs> <laughs> I still haven't got it going that fast. Um, there's a little thing called wind that we have here in Nevada that, that kind of keeps that down. Max flight time for it is, according to DGI, 28 minutes. Um, again, I've not had it in the air that long. I don't like to get close to those, those times when it's going to say, it's falling out of the air now. So, and I don't think the chief would, and the taxpayers would appreciate me pushing that limit very, very far. So our, our flight times vary to 18 to 20 minutes, somewhere in that area. Uh, it says it has max flight distance away from the controller of three miles. It does not. It will not go that far, I've tried. And um, something we'll talk about later is, is we have to keep line of sight uh, flight with the drone. I can't see three miles out into the sky on this little tiny white thing. Um, so three miles is, is not realistic. A max ceiling, get this one, 20,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> right off DJI's website for the Phantom 4. It will not go that high. I have not tried even. Um, again, there's rules and regulations that, that prohibit us from, from entering that airspace. Um, it has a 12 megapixel camera attached to it. So we get very high definition video out of it and we get great still pictures. Um, that's what it comes down to is the end product that, that we can look at and share with the public and the images that we can give our, or that the, the battalion chiefs, the people in charge in an incident, they can make real time decisions uh, with, with a camera um, of that quality, we get good images that we could make decisions on. Um, very, it's, for us, it's a tool. It's another tool in our toolbox that we have at our disposal. So some of the rules and regulations that we have to follow. Um, just because we're a government agency, we're a city organization, um, doesn't preclude us from these rules and regs. Uh, at the federal level, there is what is considered um, the FFA Part 107, which kind of governs all commercial and public, or no, not public, just commercial drone use. Um, so for an agency like Carson City Fire Department to um, fly one of these drones or small um, unmanned aerial aircraft, uh, we have to pass, the, the pilot in charge has to pass 
a knowledge test through the FFA, administered by the federal, uh, or by the FFA. Or we can get a certificate of authorization, which is a bunch of paperwork that we can fill out that gives the department or the agency applying for that authorization um, kind of a blanket authorization that they will train and take care of their, their pilots, um, have ongoing training, and they have standard operating procedures, and, and you have to document all that stuff. We have not gone through that process yet. Uh, I, I think we will do that down the road as our uh, drone program starts to expand. But at this point, I am the only uh, registered or certified pilot within Carson City Fire Department. Um, there's a couple pilots within the Public Works Department. Um, and that they have their own Phantom 4 that they use. Oh. <coughs> so that's all at the federal level. At the state level, in 2015, the State Assembly passed the bill, uh, Assembly Bill 239, which uh, drove the NRS, Nevada Revised Statutes uh, 439, which gives us state rules and regulations on uh, drone use. One of them was we cannot weaponize a drone. They take all the fun out of stuff. <laughs> so just a, a quick overview of some of our rules and regulations that we have to follow through uh, FFA in Part 107 is uh, we have to fly within line of sight. So we have to keep the drone in sight at all times. Um, we can't use binoculars. We can't use any uh, aid, anything to aid our sight to get it out there farther. Um, so we have to keep it within line of sight. We can't fly at night. Um, what they consider nighttime is um, 30 minutes past sunset to 30 minutes before sunrise. Um, the picture there, if these lights could go out, it'd be a whole lot better. But uh, it was a sunrise picture I took uh, from the west side of Carson, looking out towards the east. It's really cool. It's got all kinds of house lights and everything in there, but you can't see it. So I apologize for that. Uh, we have to stay within 400 feet of the ground at all times. Um, as we gain elevation on the west side, we, we do a lot of uh, drone activity on the west side of, of Carson City. Very hilly, so we have to stay within 400 feet of the ground at all times. And we have to stay under 100 miles an hour. Take all the fun out of it. And we can't fly over crowds. We can't fly over people. Um, when we do fly over people, they have to be briefed and be part of the operation. Uh, we use our drone. The main purpose of using our drone is documenting fuels reduction projects. Um, if we can get aerial footage before we do the, the fuels project or fuels reduction and then after, uh, we get dramatic results. Um, we use it for training purposes. We have a training facility over by the airport. It's actually right next to the airport. It uh, complicates things a little bit with flying the drone. But as our personnel go through a training scenario, we can video it with the drone from above. And then once they're done, we can take that back and watch that. And our personnel can critique themselves. They can say, OK, I'm, I'm not pulling this hose out the right way off the truck. What if I change my technique? And so. By analyzing the footage, the, the video, we're better able to serve the public. We can get quicker, we can get better at what we do. Um, recent flood assessments. We can use the drone to capture footage um, of, say, the Carson River. How, how, you know, how high is the Carson River running right now? Um, I could go out, take a, a quick video of the Mexican Dam area, any part of the river that emergency managers are concerned about and bring them back, you know, 20 minute old footage that shows them exactly what's going on. Our emergency managers can't be everywhere in the city at, at any given time. So if we can bring this information back to them, they make more educated decisions. Um, saves time 
and, and ultimately taxpayer dollars. We can use uh, the drone for hazmat incidents. We haven't um, had one since we've had the drone, but we have talked about it. If we can send a drone to get pictures or video of a hazmat spill, hazardous materials, we know the size of it, we know what we need to go in with, bef instead of sending a person in there that can possibly be exposed. Um, it just gives us more information to make decisions before we actually go there. Um, saves time and it, it reduces the exposure to our firefighters. Uh, search and rescue, if, if we had a thermal camera, which more than likely will be coming in the, in the future for us, um, search and rescue incidents where we can cut the time down to where we find that person. Um, there's incidents throughout the year where we get somebody lost. Kings Canyon, Ash Canyon, somebody rolled off the road, their vehicle rolled, or, or what have you. Any search and rescue, hikers out there, a, a mountain biker is lost, they don't know where they are. If we can get out there and find that person quicker from the air, um, we're going to be able to get emergency personnel to them quicker. Again, saves time. Time is, is lives. Um, we use the drone for wildfire mapping. When we have uh, the several wires, fires we had this year on the west side, we were able to map and identify the areas. You know, as, as soon as the flames were out, we're up there mapping it and getting an idea on what kind of restoration efforts we have to, as a city, if it's on city property, we have to do to control erosion, um, help out the stream beds, and, and all kinds of stuff. Again, it's just gathering information so we can make, and city managers can make better decisions. Uh, we've used the drone for wildfire investigations. Um, our investigators can go out and look at everything on the ground, but when you get a different perspective from directly above, you notice burn patterns and stuff that you can't see when you're looking at it on the ground. Um, so we are able to identify the origin of the fire, where it started quicker, by using drone technology and drone footage. So the picture here is, um, I don't know which one's the, the pointer, but anyway. The, uh, I just wanted the, the laser point. Oh. Okay, this is uh, up in the Timberline area. There's, there's a, God, these lights are killing all these pictures. Uh, this is a fuels reduction project that we completed up in the Timberline area. The right side has been treated and the left side is untreated. Basically, you can see from the air that the right side, there's a whole lot less brush. Fire moving through this brush would uh, basically stop at this point before it got to the community, which is farther to the right. Gives us a fuel break around the community. Whoop. All right, you can start that video, please. The 2017 fuel reduction season has been a very productive one for Carson City Fire Department. As this video shows, our overall goals in fuels reduction is to modify fire behavior. One of the ways we do that is with mechanical mastication. Thinning of the brush directly relates to fire behavior. As this video shows, the area in the middle has been mechanically masticated to reduce the fuels and increase spacing between the brush. The area above the road is representative of what this area used to look like. By increasing the spacing of the vegetation, we are directly affecting fire behavior. By reducing fire intensities and reducing flame rates, giving firefighters a chance to suppress an oncoming wildfire. The community of Timberline is just off to the right of this video. A wind-driven wildfire in this area will hit this fuel break and most likely slow down and lay down giving firefighters a chance to suppress the fire before it gets into the Timberline community. Here, a contractor is using a mid-sized excavator, a Caterpillar 316, and a small skid steer to grind up the vegetation. These skilled operators are able 
to pick and choose which brush they want to grind up and which brush is best to leave. This area is key winter range for mule deer, so we chose to leave as much bitter brush as we can while grinding up sage brush and snow brush or tobacco brush. Apologize for these lights that you guys can't see very well. Can y'all see okay or, or are we? So that was an example of our fuels reduction project and what, how we use the drone. Here's some flood assessment. Um, this is some video that was taken of the river yesterday. So that's how quickly um, we are gathering this information and making decisions. As you can see, it's flowing bank to bank right already. And this is the Mexican dam area. Besides the last two years, Mexican dam hasn't flowed like that in a long time. In Carson City, we have a bunch of people that recreate along the Carson River. And you can see quickly how if somebody has fallen in the river, we can use, use the drone to locate that person and, and get emergency personnel to those people quicker. The quicker we get to them, the more chances we have to save them. This is uh, some, some footage taken of our tra at our training facility um, of firefighter recruits. Putting out a simulated car fire, at least this one is. <clears throat> and during these training scenarios, the firefighter doing, doing the training, they're nervous. It's something not necessarily new, but they're trying to hone their skills. And when they can watch this video afterward, it gives them the feedback on how they might um, improve their skills. Another simulated car fire. We have lots of car fires in Carson, by the way. <laughs> We do. And here's a swift water rescue. Um, that's one of our fire captains in the water. He's right there, you can't see him. And this is one of our rescue techniques. This is the garden fire from last August. Um, you can see we can quickly identify areas that, that we're going to have to rehab. Uh, fire started up in here, and it actually burnt to the south. Uh, again, we use this as a tool to gather information. The more information we have, the better decisions we can make in emergency situations. That's all I got for you. It's nice to be back in my hometown, class of 74. Any other Carson Meyer out there? Okay, I guess it's just me. Um, I'm an environmental scientist, and I do natural resource assessments using drones and other different types of tools. This is just one tool in my toolbox. But tonight, I want to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about, and I hope that um, we can find a few citizen scientists pilots by the end of my talk. Okay, so um, 
you saw how these tools are used in different types of industry, and that is true, that's how we all use them. But like geocaching, um, drones are turning civilians into this air force of citizen scientists. There we go. And uh, this last year, there were three million shipped. Right now, they estimate there's 600,000 commercial drones. Um, that's, and it's only, what, April? And they estimate 7 million by 2020. And the value of this citizen scientist in the smaller drone industry is supposed to be 3.3 billion this year with 13 billion by 2020. And it's estimated that 8% of all Americans own a drone. And if you think about the numbers, when you think about it, that means every man, woman, and child in New Jersey owns one. That's a lot. Okay, so what's a drone? Well, actually, the scientists love to say that it's an unmanned aerial system or an unmanned aerial aircraft. And you've seen them, they could be blimps, they could be flapping wings, they could be rotary wings or fixed wings, but it's just basically an unmanned aircraft. Okay, so why UAS? Why, why would we use these things? The difference is clear. The top photograph, I mean, you know, the spy in the sky goes over the Earth every 16 days and we get a photograph. It's pretty cool, but it's one meter resolution. The one on the bottom is 5.5 um, centimeter resolution and it took less than 20 minutes to fly. So, what does this UAS stand for? Well, it's a system, and I'm not going to go into this, but it's all kinds of parts. And so in that little drone that you saw, there was a body, there's this command and control link, and then there's the ground control station. And so if you become a volunteer, citizen scientist, these things are important to you because you have different missions. Okay, so to me, like the top right, that aircraft is made out of foam. If it fell out of the sky and hit you on the head, it wouldn't hurt you. But it can stay up in the air for up to two hours. And I can do an, in an hour and 20 minutes, I can fly an entire section of land at about six inch resolution, six pixel, so six inch resolution. 640 acres in an hour and 20 minutes. You just can't do that anymore. And those are just different types of aircraft. Okay, so who's the next drone pilot? It's you. It's everyone in this room. And if you look at just grab some of these, and I'm going to find a pointer now. Uh, construction, agriculture, mine inspection, roof inspection, delivery. Uh, I love the one that's instant gratification. It actually is. <laughs> Boating, oil exploration, weather monitoring, crop dusting. You can go through here, and it's in every single industry. It's pretty cool. But these are real citizen scientist projects. So last year, the Nature Conservancy got together and they asked for drone pilots. They got 1,600 volunteer drone pilots who went up and down the California coast to map coastal erosion. It was some of the best data that they had. And these were all volunteers. And you could do um, crowdsourcing for trees, um, like for fish. There's projects for river dolphins, plastic in the ocean, endangered species, and near to my heart, climate change. Because um, I don't care what fence you sit on about climate change, we all know that we're getting less snow, it's warmer, and we're getting more rain in the Sierras. And so if you have an army of volunteers out there helping collect data for climate scientists, what difference might that make? So what we rely on at this table is both visible light and then light that is not visible to humans. And so in whatever mission we're going to fly, you heard about infrared and thermal, we all look at this light range, and I'm not going to bore you with it. I just want you to know that um, we look at it. OK, so this um, photo that's down, this is a crop photo thing. There it is. Um, that talks about what's happening with the crop over a course of a day. But this photograph that's right here, that's field to tailgate. 
So you're a farmer, I can come out with my hobby drone that's less than $2,000, and we can fly that, and you could know today, this afternoon. You don't have to wait. Okay, so what do you need to fly if you're going to be kind of citizen scientist, hobby drone? You're either a hobbyist, but if you're going to be a serious citizen scientist, we'd like to get you um, into the FAA certification. And honestly, it's not that hard. You pass a test, you read the rules. Um, please don't fly above 400 feet, don't fly at night, and don't fly for crowds. But you could be out there collecting valuable data today, and there are sites, hundreds of sites that you can disseminate your data. If you like to geocache, you're going to be hooked on this. Okay, again, so why UAS? So I have a client, they have a river. The river does not behave. So this is what's on NAPE's imagery. This is what's publicly available. And uh, they can't afford to send a manned aircraft out. So in 2016, we flew, this is the same river bin. Here it is in 2017 and 2018. And the reason that's important is because they're going to spend quite a bit of money. I think, oops, better go back. Maybe. Oh, don't touch it. They're going to spend a lot of money doing some um, bank stabilization. And they need to know, if the river's moving around that much, where do I put it? So this is taken by a volunteer drone pilot that gave me the photos so that, you know, their money would stretch further. And if you look at this, these red lines are where they're going to end up doing erosion control because over time, between 2000 and 2018, that's where we can fight the river back or actually do something that's going to matter for water quality and shading. So um, I also have another client. We're moving a dam and restoring a river, and this is the upper Yuba River. And we needed to do some monitoring because, believe it or not, some people want dams to stay in. Some people don't like them. My client doesn't. And so um, at 2016, that was July, and just less than a year later, after implementing a certain um, receding program, you can see what they got on the bottom. Same thing, just a different area. So I was going to do a demonstration, but anyway, uh, I'm just going to grab it. I'm not going to turn it on right now. That's bad. I won't turn it on right now. This weighs less than an egg. So just you, everybody just had Easter. This is meant for kids. It flies 13 minutes, and it's meant for kids because high school students or junior high can take in a program and fly in these forms. It also does video. It's really hard to get hurt with it, but they're amazing. This is $90, and yet with this simple little device, we can collect citizen scientists' data that's very valuable. If you go back to the one with the, um, the river, it took that guy flies out every, or he drives out every Wednesday and does flights, and um, they're they're doing a flight program, and it's invaluable information. And this is a guy who's retired, but uh, wanted to make a difference in his own community. Okay, so um, I'm going to just play a little bit of this because I think our time is almost up. And it's about two minutes, but this was made with a thousand dollar drone, a free package that comes with um, Microsoft Office called Movie Maker, and I paid 99 cents to um, Amazon for the music. So if somebody could click it up there. And this was meant to sway public attention, position. We had just um, taken this dam, notched it so that we could get the water in this river flowing free again. This um, river had been, it'd been under a reservoir since 1902 and they thought that it was completely silted in and when we 
released the water, we found an active, engaged river. Flying in the winter time, which is pretty fun, um, allows us to see things that we can't necessarily see during the growing season. And this particular client purchased uh, nine sections of land, 5,000 acres, to protect a watershed in perpetuity on the South Haver River on Donner Pass.
for efficiency, you often want to be the online site, but that's the regulatory edge, if you will, that, that exists today for good reason. But that uh, is being basically um, pushed or explored between the private and government sectors with the FAA to get everybody comfortable with where the technology can allow you know, safe use uh, in the future. So. And one other thing you probably should know is most of the drones that you buy on Amazon or wherever, once it loses its signal from the actual controller you have, most of them have built-in software that will stop it and have it come back. And that's why, you know, Rod was saying they could never go beyond that because as soon as it loses that signal, it's programmed to stop and either land or come back depending on whatever type of drone they have. The larger ones, you can override that function uh, if they have the endurance, but then it goes back to the FAA regulations and either being able to leave them or they have to work it for. But uh, that's one of the biggest limitations actually built in for a safety reason into most of the, uh, the smaller size drones because so, they really don't want people flying it so far away and if they just lose control and don't know what it's doing. So. You know, uh, one other thing is that batteries have gotten so sophisticated, they're um, called intelligent batteries now, and they actually will, I program in, I want this drone to come back to 25% battery life. And if the conditions in the sky are too windy, it knows how, how far away it is. It does the calculation and decides it might send it back at 40% because it knows it's gonna need that to get back to me. So. It's pretty hard to screw these up if you just follow the rules. Another comment I'll make is the, the leading manufacturers like DJI, et cetera, that make um, both consumer drones all the way up into commercial drones, et cetera, um, they're trying to be good citizens in this space, safety precautions, et cetera, working within these rules. And so like this um, small one here, there's, there's other ways too, and I'm a parent, is to say, okay, you get, a kid gets one of these, what's he gonna do? You, you can set it up like you might with your satellite TV uh, service to say, what can they do? And you can, you can set up in the software what's called a geofence that says they can't fly out of X range of the person that's launching it. Sort of like the, uh, the dog collar uh, <laughs> for some yards. It's visible fence. Yeah. And you can set the max altitude too. Yeah. So. And Rod, I think you have some comments. No, yeah, they covered it all. <laughs> Great. Uh, so these are questions addressed to um, Lieutenant Colonel Rack. Uh oh. Uh, <laughs> asking regarding hydrogen power, um, what other applications are possible? That's a pretty broad question. But here, let me bring it down to one. Um, for fire drones, um, what to what temperature can you are they of use? For the, the hydrogen specifically, one of the limitations of hydrogen is actually being able to harness it in such a way that you can utilize it, which is very expensive to do so. Um, I, I would tell you that it, it, there are smaller versions of that plane that you saw that doesn't have to be. You know, that plane itself, I think, is like 70 feet long. I don't know what the wingspan is on it. Um, and the reason why they're looking at that, because there is an abundance of hydrogen. You know, you talk about fuel, you've got to have a lot of it to use. And for the very large scale type of uh, UAVs or drones or UAS, whatever you want to call them, that's a perfect fuel for them to go out and test at, at the, the levels that they want to fly at and whatnot. Um, as far as the fire fighting goes, I don't know, could you kind of repeat what the, the question was along those lines? Or yeah. was it pertaining to hydrogen and use of firefighting? Or Yes, you know. what, yeah, how, how, uh, when a drone goes into a, a big measurement on a fire, uh, mm -hmm. how, where's the temperature, what's the temperature range? How, how far is the fire from the drone? Not very far. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I will say this, there, this is a new technology, right? So everyone is designing different types of drones with fire, uh, retardant, and other things on what they can actually do. And I use that um, example because there's a drone being built right now that actually can fly into fires and it's being used not for firefighting or, or to put out a fire, but it's being used on very large size boilers uh, from some companies in Texas and others. And the reason being is they have to periodically, I don't know if it's quarterly or semi-annually, shut down all of these boilers all the way, let them cool, and then send somebody in to actually inspect these. 
And what they're finding is if you can get a drone, it can still be pretty hot. They can go in and send a drone and it makes a visual, not just inspection, but also you know the camera, the, the filming of it, and then come back out and save them tremendous money because for every hour these um, these big kind of kilns that are shut down, it's money out of the, the company's pocket. Uh, as far as regular firefighting, you saw that one drone depiction. Two things you need to know about that. Uh, it's hooked up to a power source already on a vehicle that's full up, so it's not even batteries at that point, it's just a power source. And then it, it's strong enough with the engines, the electrical engines that are on it to lift a certain amount of water to a certain amount of height and actually shoot it up. It's been tested. Um, but as far as fly, you know, flying normally into that, I would say they have to keep a safe distance, you know, just for that very reason. Because they're not as bad heat tolerant at this point. And where those are being used uh, mostly is high rise buildings. Um, you have a truck, the way it's, that I understand it, and, and there's a truck basically dedicated to that drone. It's got a power source and a water source. They can send the drone up and shoot the water inside apartment, you know, 14C or whatever it is. And um, before we can ever get firefighters up there, so it's a quick reaction to, to knock down the fire quickly and make it safer for firefighters to enter that building or that apartment or that room. Okay, a couple questions for Eric. Um, when you mentioned finding unexploded bombs, can you tell us if this mm -hmm. is used in Cambodia, where there are so many unexploded bombs? Well, um, the military and uh, civilian entities all over the world are you know, plagued, unfortunately, with this you know, problem. Uh, and I'm not sh sure specifically with the Cambodia question, who's doing what with, with drones, but um, the opportunity there is to greatly enhance and improve in a safer way um, the detection of finding stuff. And so right now, um, I'm sure many of you can imagine how uh, scary this is. Um, a lot of this is done by humans on the ground you know, in a search pattern kind of way. Uh, and whether it's unexploded ordnance that was left over, like dud bombs, or it's specifically live munition that's still out there in the field, like landmines, etc. This is cutting edge turf for any aerial imaging to be done. And we use hyperspectral and multispectral to sort of suss out what is the signature of a disturbed area of soil or part of a munition that's, that is showing up. And this is where um, a lot of the cutting edge science, not just for this application, exists in artificial intelligence and machine learning and imaging. So if I say, find this thing out there in the field, and um, I basically give that software feedback to say, uh, okay, you looked at this 100 acres and you found 14 suspicious or, or probable uh, items that might be this, but these three you found are this, good job. It's now learning on each successive image collection what is you know, the accurate one. So obviously that scales up very well if you're looking over you know, thousands of acres in a very coarse way to narrow down areas of interest to say this has, these areas have X amount of highly probable uh, cases for let's say a bomb. Something very similar, not necessarily in Cambodia, but the military, when we flew our, our particular platforms out of Southern Nevada, we would follow convoy because IEDs were being planted along the roads. And so one thing we did find, and what he just mentioned was about the, uh, multi-spectrum and hyperspectral camera, if you can imagine, if somebody goes out and digs a hole in the road, and most of these are done relatively recent to convoys that go across because there's other traffic on these roads. But just by digging up that soil, putting that device in there and covering it again, if you have certain filters that we can put on different types of cameras, multi- and hyperspectral cameras, we can actually pick out those spots in the dirt on the road and, and stop convoys before they actually go over and then they have bomb crews and other robotic bomb crews that will go out there and actually extract those. 
So we're getting much better at that. Unfortunately, in some of the third world countries, that technology is available, but they're not able to afford it, or there's just, you know, politically, in some of those areas, it's very tough to get some of the U.S. assets in there as well, so. And then a question I had, Eric, for the work that you do, um, are there certifications required for your personnel? Yes, uh, the same stuff that we've been talking about from the FAA 107, uh, <coughs> the modern version of that uh, for operations. We also have to get, uh, and I think Rod mentioned this, um, in certain areas we'll have to get permission from the government or the landowners or adjacent landowners, sometimes it's a courtesy thing so they're not startled, um, or what's called a COA, um, which is a certificate of authorization to be in an area doing a certain type of activity. And when it comes into, uh, you can't fly over people, but even just flying near people, uh, the, the other thing that we do and do in concert with government is notifications. And it may be signage, etc. saying you know, there's gonna be a drone operating over there doing mapping of this, you know, forest area or mine area, etc. So people understand, okay, you know, that's that's how it's being done. It's being done legally and it's being done with permission. Okay, and then Kathy, while you're seeing if there's anybody um, that wants to ask a question directly, just have one more. Um, and probably uh, for Rod, um, how are the how are your drones funded? Is there actually a budget line item for that? Do you have to seek grants? I'm not exactly sure where the, I mean, it, it, it was not grant funded. Um, the original drone purchase was not grant funded. It came through city funds somewhere else, way above my pay grade, that's for sure. Um, so I, I don't necessarily have that answer for you, but the, the ongoing um, program doesn't take much funding at all. It's basically my time, um, some computer space for the, the images and, and some of the footage, um, very minimal maintenance on the on the drone itself, new propellers, you know, very minimal. I hope that answers. Uh, are you familiar with the street mapping that Carson City does, where we use a vehicle that has a camera and we actually drive the street? Do you foresee a future where we're going to do that with, <clears throat> with the U? Well, when they do it from the, the street view, there's multiple cameras getting multiple angles. Um, I would guess in the future we could do that with drones. Um, it's a possibility. Okay. Kathy. Does anybody else have a question? Go ahead and stand up. And I'd like to ask you to put a little more context about how you mentioned hydrogen power and hydrogen power gives them stay in the air for say, 10 days and then you come out and in comparison to a uh, electric power drone is, is maybe possible to stay up for a few hours. Now, I'm sure there's some basics that haven't yet learned, but uh, considering, uh, comparing hydrogen power to electric power and what hydrogen power is so much So it's all about the scope and the size of something. And, and what happens with, and same thing with the, uh, just having a gas engine versus a, an electric engine. Gas engine efficiency, there's a certain horsepower and size that it actually plays into a more efficient, based on the way the fuel and other things that are associated with it, with a small drone. The same goes for that large Boeing Phantom aircraft, which is a drone, it's, it's, it's unmanned. Um, but as far as hydrogen, very expensive, probably possible to scale it down to something that we would consider, you know, three, four, five feet wide. I don't know all the physics behind doing that, but I think the mere cost of it would probably yield somebody to say, you know, this particular drone doesn't need to be powered by hydrogen when I can get a fixed wing drone or something and go survey that area accordingly. Right? So I guess what I'm telling you is it's available, it's done in a large scale because of the, the nature of harnessing it and the cost. And I don't see it anytime soon being done on a small size, although 
Would it be productive? Yes, but I think you know hydrogen itself, if you understand the periodic charge and its volatility, there's some things you probably wouldn't want everyone flying a hydrogen drone around your, your neighborhood uh, for a lot of different reasons. So, um, and it is flammable. So if you shoot hydrogen, it's, it's reasonably called a hydrogen bomb. It's so not readily it's, available at Walmart. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but some people probably will. <laughs> One thing you would, and when I say a lot, mostly low level, I'm sure he can tell you, and I know I heard somebody discussing it earlier, like whenever there's a fire in Nevada or California, there's always that drone, you know, RC enthusiast that wants to take his drone out there and get his own film footage, which inevitably you read in the paper shuts down the whole air operation until they clear that. You know, part of why the FAA has come out with its regulations as such is because it was so restricted at first people were just doing it anyway. They're like, you know, it's unfair that we can't fly these at all. And then they said, okay, maybe if we open up and make it where it's legal, zero to 400 feet AGL uh, in these areas, then, then they can go out and fly these and they don't bug us all the time. How do we get special dispensation for everybody in this country, which is literally millions now, that own a drone and want to go fly it? Uh, the incursions have been a lot. There's things that the regulations are supposed to prevent against that, and I can tell you that what we were doing with NASA was trying to prevent that as well, and it was called the UTM Traffic Management System for Drones. So two things, the regulations currently kind of keep the small drones where they're supposed to be. It doesn't make it fail safe, because helicopters also fly below, you know, surface to 500 feet, but it's pretty good, and if you're gonna fly in the Carson City airspace, if you're gonna fly, you know, where it's controlled, or in Reno especially, you have to actually get approval even if you're going to stay underneath that 400 feet if you're within a radius of five miles of the airport. So um, that's usually good enough. However, there are those enthusiasts that take it beyond that. So the new regulations and some of the new stuff that's coming out as far as sense and avoid that if you're a pilot you've seen on regular aircraft where it'll see things in front of you and in the Air Force I'll just say we call it the bitch and Betty where you had something that was always chiming on you either about terrain or if there was another thing that we hadn't seen we hadn't acknowledged it. Um, the same thing is true with the, the next generation of the drones that are coming out, is that uh, the software and other things, LiDAR and things that are gonna actually, will become commonplace on them. We'll see other drones. Manned aircraft will be able to see them before, you know, right now they can't because they're not really integrated into all the IFF and other things that the normal man, manned aircraft have. So, long answer short, um, Yes, there's regulations in place that help with the decompletion. Yes, there have been incursions. There will be more incursions. But as you move forward and the planes get smarter without even the, the drone operator know what's going on, you'll probably have less and less of those as we move forward. It's, one, it's a great question because that was one of the biggest concerns is the midair, uh, you know, with these drones that shouldn't be out there. Now, most of the small drones are not like a bird. So typically, they're not going to bring down an airline. They could cause damage, but they're not going to, you know, Cause, cause it to crash. There's a uh, uh, number of incidents between drones and manned aircraft in the U.S. that have resulted in an aircraft having to maneuver to avoid a collision. As of 12, 11, 15, that's the latest that I could find, was 28 incidents, although that does seem low. But you have to remember, uh, we fly below 400 feet. Uh, well, no, let's just, I fly below 400 feet. If a manned aircraft comes, they have the right of way and I land immediately. If I'm between three and five miles from the airport, whether it's towered or untowered, there's certain protocols that I have to follow. And so um, these things can be flown very, very safely. Um, it's the real, the real hobbyist that's out there that we have to worry about. I don't, you know, because I'm not going to risk my license. Yeah, my comment is it's, it's not about really the drones. Uh, it's about the humans that are operating <laughs> all sorts of aircraft. The other statistic that never gets contrasted to that kind of thing is aircraft to aircraft near misses, which is, with small aircraft is huge, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's an age old problem. But one thing that's um, a, a great improvement that's coming in, on top of what Warren said is you can fire up an amp on your phone today and say, I want to fly my drone over here for this job. And you'll instantly know what that space is in a permission sense. And if you visualize this uh, from an airplane,
therefore, there's an inverse cone out through airspace that's basically saying if you're closer into the airport than X, you can't fly. Or if you're one radius out, you can fly, but only up to this altitude, etc. So imagine all the air traffic coming and going from all airports, etc. It's to create this safe zone to keep that isolation away. And as Warren said, there's um, software and hardware coming so that all kinds of aircraft can be aware of each other and who has the right of way can actually be forced you know, into the equation. Um, and I, I think of it as like walking out on, a, on hiking trails. You've got mountain bikers and hikers and horses, etc. and there's courtesy, but there's also really rules of the road. So here comes an airplane and there's a rogue drone out there in the not too distant future. That rogue drone will be shut down in a return to home sense because he's not in safe airspace. Another question? So you mean that the, the drones will be programmed so that if you have a lunatic flying this thing that doesn't care about the rules, the drone will, will for example, not fly within five miles of an airport. Yes, right. And, 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 and it won't fly more than 400 Well, it's not right now, though. I mean, no, he, because he can override his own. But, but that, that's, that's, that is what's coming. And, and I was giving credit earlier to some of the leading drone manufacturers. They want, they don't, they don't want this to be a problem. So DJI is a good example. They're trying to work with government agencies worldwide to say, well, what are the best ways to create these kind of automated controls and, and basically fencing um, to prevent that? And uh, it's, to give you another example is if you try to launch most drones that are below a certain level of battery strength, they won't they won't take off. Even though you think, oh, I got a minute left. Why not? No. Um, so similarly, that's what's coming in the, um, the, the test guys, and we work with a couple of them that are um, excited about that, is to be able to say, yes, those, those kind of uh, software and technology systems will basically be overriding humans in this case. Uh, so. One more thing I want to add too is there's a tremendous amount of money being spent right now on anti-drone technology. And that's primarily for Homeland Defense, first responders and others. And that goes from handheld lasers that will literally shoot one of these little DJIs right out of the sky to small, very, um, uh, micro, how do I put this, very uh, targeted electromagnetic pulses that literally pointed once at these small aircraft. It doesn't have a wide cone. You hit it, it basically shuts down the electronics on it and out it comes up the sky. So uh, that's also part of the drone industry. You have the people that use it right and the people that aren't using it right, which is a very small number, and then you've got to have some kind of controls because you can't just be subject to some person that thinks they're just going to fly all over where they shouldn't be. Um, Las Vegas had a big problem when drones first came out because everyone thought they needed to fly right down the strip and show you all these great pictures of Las Vegas with their drones, right? Well, now the police got smart about it. They realized if you see one of those drones not very far away because in the line of sight is the drone operator. So they would just follow. They wouldn't even call in. They'd follow and sure enough, inevitably they'd go back and there's, you know, uh, UAV pilot Bob out there trying to, you know, blame his friends with his Snapchat videos. So they're getting wiser to it. Lots of applicability there. Um, we're doing a pilot uh, project up at Lake Tahoe uh, with near shore zones for um, impacts uh, both in just the natural states and natural conditions of drought versus you know, uh, bountiful runoff um, versus man made impacts. And the TRPA, which regulates a lot of the stuff up there, of course, um, is very interested in, in trying to do a better job of periodically monitoring um, those shallow near zones areas that are the most um, sensitive. So great applicability um, for all of that, yes. The, um, the remote sensing, the, the whole field of remote sensing has really come down to these small aircraft, and the answer is yes, because the salinity and the water 
temperatures of these other areas are different. And so we have um, over-the-counter um, sensors right now that you can put on one of these smaller units that do that type of mapping. So, yes, the, the, it is here now. There's, you just, the sensors are just unbelievable right now. When I first started doing this, um, we flew probably a 300 acre area, and we had seven small um, desktops put together, and it took two weeks to stitch the map, and we were using this Babel cluster just to get the, the photographs to stitch together, and now I can go out and fly a couple hundred acres and see the map as it's flown on my iPad. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable what's happening. Yeah, this is almost a taboo subject, but I think about an article I read here about the drones and the, the engineering and the, the design of the rotor, the rotor placement and the silence. Uh, it's not a protected science yet, but also small drones. They're, they're very small drones. They're used for uh, conspicuous reasons, questionable reasons, but uh, small drones, there's also, can you, can you comment on that? Drones are But they're limited, again, they're limited by their power source. And so um, no matter how small it is, it, if it's got a camera or some kind of sensor or it's sending you information, um, it's limited by its battery life. So while it might be very, very small, it's also going to have a very short life before it falls to the ground. So Lori, do you have information for would be um, uh, amateur Drone, your drone uh, yeah. game. Uh, <laughs> my my email address is here, but it's lauricey@nevada.unr.edu. And I, anyone who wants to just meet us at the airfield, um, I used to show up and there's all these young kids, and the grandma would show up, and all these kids were like, whoa. And then it, finally, it was, oh, she's cool. <laughs> so yeah, there's a really great RC field here. Um, in Carson, and there's great places to fly. So, and you're always looking for spotters, because um, you know you're trying to stretch your budget and get more flight time in, because you never know in the wind conditions. And these things don't fly in rain, and they don't like hot, and they don't like cold. I was in Finland over January, and <laughs> I actually had the, my phone froze in my hand. And I had already pre-programmed in where I wanted to see the land, thank God, because three minutes up and it had land. So it's pretty good weather conditions that you have to have. And I'm sure that the speakers wouldn't mind hanging out just for a few minutes in case people have something specific or you want to get up more information if you'd like to join her, her uh, brigade of people. Kathy, there was one more question. Right well, was there? Right, 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 right. Right. Just going back to what you were oh. talking about, having them uh, in, in sight, pilot should have in sight. So if spotters are allowed, the pilot doesn't necessarily have to, just so he's in touch with somebody that can see it. All my people have radios, and legally I'm the pilot in command, and I can, as long as I'm in control of the aircraft, it's already programmed in. And what we do is we have grids, so A calls to B, B calls to C, C calls to G, G goes to F, and then wherever it happens to be flying. But you can't say you just have to maintain positive control in the aircraft. So they can't go on an autonomous mission and then, you know, flying out there. You say, well, I got people that have eyes on it. doesn't matter if they have control. And uh, there, all of the programs, uh, one of the three, I mean, it's a shareware, is mission plan, it's free. And whenever um, other aircraft or you're concerned, you have already pre-programmed in where it's going, what we call loiter, just sits there and spins, to, like if people were to come or wildlife or something were to happen, um, you, you plan all of this into the mission, what can go wrong? So yeah, great, I'd like to give you a great round of applause.